As I walk the winding pathway through the singing crystal plains of Amoria, winged avorials soared overhead in low clouds of silver, lit with shimmering rainbows, with the crystals all around me, their voices drifting melodies over a song of wordless tones that thrummed in air as crisp and pure as first winter's snow. My heart seemed to want to burst from my chest and take flight with them. Waves of pleasure and sweet sorrow came from deep within me, and it was four days before I realized my face had been wet with tears that whole time. As evening came, the sky was not dark, but lit by a sunset of colors that set the crystals on fire, and as cool winds whistled their own song the next day, I would rest on the smooth crystal, which was as warm as a mother's embrace. When I felt thirst, there was a clear pool of water, and when I felt hunger, there were rich mushrooms, sweet berries, and even the grass at my feet, was as fragrant and delicious as market herbs. I wandered without hurry, as I had forgotten where I was going, and no longer cared why. Even now I realised that I had never, and will never again know such peace as I felt there, as I walked in paradise. And I'm told, this was just one such place. As vast as it was, there are vistas even more wonderful, and my soul aches to be there among them. Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett, and I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore, and lots of them. In this video, I will be taking you on a journey to the celestial realms of Elysium, a place of pure goodness. While it is a location that your player characters may travel to in the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse, as an outer plane beyond the astral expanse, it is a place beyond even my abilities to truly describe. It is the last reward of beings who were, above all else, good at heart. Those who gave of themselves without expectations, who cared for others, who trusted, who healed, who helped, who nurtured, and who valued friendship and love highest among all things. It is the resting place of heroes, martyrs, and champions. Yes, it is the home of gods of love, light, and hope. Yes, it is also the peaceful home of those who also just lived a simple life, doing what they could for others in small ways every day, because it made them feel right. It is the place that waits for those who could not turn their back on others in need, for those who gave up glory for service, and for those who quietly endured and worked for the greater benefit of all. Elysium is not the name of a plane of existence, really. It encompasses four realms, who have quite loosely defined boundaries, and yet within themselves are actually limitless. The outer planes may feel a bit like planets, but they certainly aren't structured that way. If you keep walking in one direction, you'll never wind up back where you started. And if wandering ever onward to see what wonders you will discover next is your greatest pleasure, then this is the realm for you. If you mention the word Elysium to someone, the first thought is normally a place where you can just lay under a sun-dappled tree while gazing over golden fields of wild grains, a dazzling landscape of idyllic beauty stretching away before you, with wafting sprites and fluttering cherubs dropping perfectly delicious fruits and beverages into your hand if you merely reach up. A place of ultimate rest unchanging and perfect. To be fair, there are places exactly like that there, but that is only a tiny slice of what Elysium has to offer. It is spectacular, it is amazing, and therein lies the danger for any mortal soul who travels there and lingers too long. Because the longer one stays, the longer one will want to stay, to need to stay, until one is no longer immortal, but has joined the peaceful dead in the afterlife, never wanting to return. All things considered, it's an amazing way to die, but it is still a very much a deadly place for those who are not careful to keep their visit brief. I'll be talking more about the specific game mechanics of these planes in just a moment. Have you got a nice beverage handy? Are you comfortable? Relaxed? Good. Let's get deeply nerdy, shall we? Elysium borders on the neighbouring outer planes of Bytopia and the Beastlands. Natural portals exist between these locations, often taking the form of caverns and cave passages found dotted randomly and naturally shifting borders between Elysium and its neighbours mean that travellers may find themselves on another good aligned plane without even realising it. 
there are plenty of landmarks for those familiar with each plane to tell when they're getting close to a border zone. For example, the local wildlife will start to feature animals of great size and beauty, which are not only golden-skinned and silvery-eyed, but also intelligent and able to speak, which lets you know that you are now very close to a border with the beastlands, as normally the celestial animals of Elysium are incapable of speech and are no more intelligent than their counterparts on the prime material plane. When approaching a cave system, a traveller may cast a divination magic to determine where the cave leads easily enough. Pretty much all magic works just as it would on the prime material plane. Many of the features of Elysium are the same, but this is quite a strongly good aligned plane. This means that creatures of evil, including player characters, will suffer disadvantage on all ability checks and saving throws that involve the wisdom, intelligence or charisma attributes. Everything here just grates on the evil character's nerves. The air itches, the sounds and smells give them headaches, the food turns their stomach, they can't get a decent moment's rest and everything just seems wrong. The very plane itself doesn't want them there. And as they will quite swiftly discover, neither do any of the inhabitants. For these reasons, it is a very rare thing to encounter evil beings, unless you happen to see their corpses being burned in little piles under the watchful eyes of some celestial or petitioners, sharing a drink and retelling the tales of their battle. There is unbelievable peace and tranquility here, but don't for a moment mistake it as a plane of sleepy laziness. It is very, very well guarded by millions of the greatest champions the multiverse has ever known. Even characters of neutral alignment will find themselves the subject of some scrutiny. They'll find the interest of the Celestials, Half-Celestials, Gardeners and Petitioners has a decidedly threatening air, and while they can enter and travel through the place, the locals will make it pretty clear that they're not welcome and best be moving along. Evil characters won't get that courtesy. They'll be lucky to escape without getting cut down where they stand. If you run your games without using alignment, the actions of the player characters and how they express themselves to the locals are much, much more important. So it's best to warn the players that any actions considered evil are very likely to have terrible consequences. And if they see any opportunity to act in a good and kindly manner by words or deeds, they better take those opportunities like their very lives depend on it, because they do. This is not a plane of law or chaos. There is no system of justice here. The actions of any particular native of the plane is entirely up to how they feel in that moment and more often than not, witnessing any act of evil will make them feel like murdering the source. Simple crimes of dishonesty, theft, fraud are far, far more serious here than any prime material dweller would consider reasonable and the punishments are severe because these are planes of reward, not redemption. You don't get to turn over a new leaf here, you get to push up daisies. Another defining trait of the planes is that all healing here is doubled, including natural healing rates, so a character will heal two hit points per hour naturally. Healing spells roll twice as many dice, and so on. Rest and relaxation is extremely restorative and wonderful. Every night's sleep is the best you will ever have. Nobody suffers aches and pains. Everyone wakes up refreshed and happy. However, if you are expecting everyone to look movie star attractive, and physically perfect, you may be a bit shocked at some of the rough locals you encounter here. Many of the petitioners look very much like they did when they were mortal beings on other planes of existence. They don't judge others based on their appearance and don't bother with ostentation. The gods and celestials may naturally go for gold, jewels and overall gorgeousness, but they'll stand next to rustic, homely and plain looking petitioners without judgement, and the phrase beauty is skin deep would not be further from the truth here. Visitors experience increasing joy and satisfaction while here. Colours become brighter and more vivid than on the material plane. Sounds more melodious and soft, and the nature of others seems more pleasant and understanding. At the conclusion of every week spent on Amoria or any of the other layers of Elysium, any visitor must make a wisdom saving throw, difficulty class 10 plus the number of consecutive weeks spent within Elysium. Failure indicates that the individual has fallen under the control of the plane becoming a petitioner of Elysium. Their mortal life is over. Effectively, they are now dead in regard to their mortal existence. Any return there requires some form of resurrection to life. Travellers entrapped by the inherent tranquility and good of Elysium will not, cannot leave the plane of their own violation and have no desire to do so. Memories of any previous life fade into nothingness and it takes a wish or a miracle spell to snap them out of it. Plus, whatever spell used to return them back to life where they came from. 
Petitioners who arrive here naturally by dying and arriving here as their just reward do tend to retain more than the usual amount of memories of their former existence, always seen through a wistful lens. They also tend to retain, at best, half of the character levels they had, so the champions of many worlds, when roused to action, can be an incredibly formidable force. And let's not forget, they're not alone. They walk beside celestials and gods, cardinals and powerful genies, aligned with pure goodness. Though nothing like the highly regimented ranks of the lawful armies of Celestia, the ragtag militia of Elysium is absolutely devastating if and when something were it to ever fully mobilize them all. The ultimate masterminds of the Infernal Plains know this, and as much as they manipulate and foment conflicts, there is a line in the sand they are always very, very careful to never cross. One of the defining features of the layers of Elysium is the River Oceanus, as this is where the river begins its journey across the upper celestial plains. Just as the river Styx flows through the lower infernal plains, the River Oceanus is fresh water, and its ultimate source is the Great Ocean of Thalasia, dotted with countless islands, which is the fourth layer of Elysium. Okay, so let's go over the four layers by order of the flow of the Great River Oceanus, and you will see how unexpectedly diverse these planar layers really are. While each of them is infinite, most activity and features of note are concentrated along the banks of the River Oceanus. So first let's travel to where the river begins. The Lazia is a vast and gentle ocean of pure water, filled with vitality and peaceful golden marine creatures. This is the source of the endless Riffy Oceanus and is dotted with countless archipelagos, many inhabited by lovely dwellings overlooking white sandy beaches and gentle coves. These islands are variously known as the Isles of the Holy Dead, the Isles of the Blessed, the shores of Avalon, the islands beyond the world, or the heroic isles. Here we find the petitioners who seek a peaceful eternity to follow their interests. They make their homes on these islands, retaining a fair bit of the knowledge and power from their previous lives. Here, hero kings wait for the day when their nations need them again, and religious scholars research great mysteries and huge libraries. Like all the layers of Elysium, the plain is divinely morphic, which means that those who have divine status are able to easily mould and form the plane's raw materials as they wish. So there are many fantastic locations to visit here if you know where to find them. As mentioned, it is common for mortals who travel to Elysium to simply become a permanent resident and petitioner just by lingering too long. And often this is quite intentional. Many great petitioners who made their journey to Thalasia while still alive but approaching death, whether from age or from wounds taken in noble battle, they may have been gently escorted here by celestial beings who have gone to collect them from the mortal world, sparing them a painful transition entirely, bypassing the journey through the ethereal plane and the judgment of the fugue plane and so on. In Thalasia, they retain their powers and memories, but are at peace with themselves and with others, the ultimate reward for good. The purpose of Thalasia may be to provide a good and just reward, but it may also be to produce recruits to become new cardinals. This is always optional, of course. Nobody would dream of forcing anyone into service as a member of the Cardinals. It tends to be fairly obvious who would enjoy that sort of existence anyway. Like all the layers of Elysium, there are gods here. Some extremely powerful ones, such as Paylor and his mighty fortress of the sun, once known as Light's Blessing, the realm of the Sun Father, the Shining One. Paylor's home is an epic manor that sprawls across multiple islands dotted with gorgeous orchards and farmlands always laden with incredible delights. On the largest island, known as Krigala, Paylor has a golden-plated citadel, shining bright as a beacon day and night. Well, night sort of doesn't exist within hundreds of miles of the island thanks to the god's influence and the brightness of the fortress of the sun. Paylor sits in a great audience chamber at the highest spire where he confers with the top ranks of the angelic host. Solars and planetars receive instructions. As a greater god, Paylor's powers of cosmic awareness are simply incredible, providing perfect intel to the angels and cardinals who happily serve him, just as he serves the greater good. Because Paylor is one of the most powerful deities in the D&D multiverse, he has a correspondingly more control over Elysium's morphic nature. Everywhere his golden light reaches, he has quite a noticeable lighter gravity effect, and all magic associated with the sun, light, and radiant energy is greatly enhanced, automatically cast as though maximized, and at the same time, all magic that creates illusions or enchantments that control the will of others are disrupted, requiring a concentration check, a disadvantage to cast or maintain. 
that is just constant qualities. Paylor can make changes to reality pretty much as he sees fit within his own domain. If he wants the air around you to turn to solid, transparent crystal, it just does. Paylor can, of course, return anyone to any location on the Prime Material Plane with a mere thought, and he is able to be present and interact with many locations on Thalasia at the same time, with fairly casual friendships with most of the practitioners who dwell on the islands. Sometimes it might be a little shocking for a mortal visitor when they realise the group of jovial figures joking and lazily sailing the pure waters, casting fishing lines and laughing in conversation includes figures of legend, demigods and even a manifestation of Paylor himself. Of course, Paylor's fishing line is cast beyond the water and into the astral sea, hauling in a wildly thrashing and very angry astral dreadnought which he throws back amid gales of laughter. The vast ocean of fresh water is not without its hazards, but they are more likely to be unintentional dangers, such as getting accidentally trampled by a golden gem-encrusted crab the size of an island that hauls itself out of the water to move from one spot to another. It may well have the villa of a petitioner on its back and just be shifting around to change the view. There are many gods here. Selkie's Grotto is the realm of Sumenir, an underwater cave complex home to the goddess of the Selkies, often visited by the gods Deep Sashalis of the Elven Pantheon, manifesting as a charismatic sea elf with deep blue skin and eyes, and Trishina, goddess of dolphins and his consort. One can also find the shining realm of the lesser Mulharandi god of light known as Seker, a good friend of Pelor, along with the lesser elven god of starlight, Araleth Letherinil. It can be a hilarious encounter for any mortal adventurers to encounter these gods just hanging out with each other on a beach or a passing ship, perhaps bumping into them at a market square in Portico, an island town near where the Oceanus flows into the layer of Beleriand, and a common stopping point for travellers. As one approaches the border zone where the layer literally spills over into the next, the ocean begins to cascade over epic land shelves. Vast drifts of rainbow illuminated mist flow around the impossible sight of drifting masses of land that float in the air, massive waterfalls plummeting into roaring pools as the river Oceanus begins its flow across the upper plains. Descending is not as hazardous as one might expect, Vessels routinely navigate the tumbling waters, seeming to sail the mists almost as much as their keels cut through the water. Dodging rapids and rocky promotories often carved in elegant forms, draped with mist-soaked plant life and the dazzling flight of bright birds and insects, with the occasional speeding blur of an angel taking one of their cosmic conduits across the multiverse nearly faster than the eye can follow. Descending deeper into the mists, one naturally transitions to the next layer of Elysium, and quite a dramatic change in scenery as we have now arrived in the realm known as Beleriand, the least widely known layer of Elysium. Beleriand is a vast realm of endless swamps. The perfect visual for this is the planet Dagobah from Star Wars. The realm of swamps, steaming bayous and large island jungles resembles Earth during the Carboniferous period, a riot of abundant life. It may seem like such a place would be unpleasant, but there is none of the biting insects, leeches, predatory reptiles and wickedly poisonous spiders and such here. Or if they are... They pay no attention to petitioners, celestials and mortal travellers. Here the Oceanus is no more than a tangled braid of slow moving water through uncountable channels with low flooded sandbars and tangles of mangroves rising from it. Still, the positive nature of Elysium shines through everywhere. The fog itself seems to spread light with each wispy tendril, surrounding each torch and lantern with luminous nimbuses. The few communities that exist in Beleriand rise from the rocky spurs that jut from the swamp. These small towns are usually built around a cathedral-like lighthouse whose beacon pierces the mildly luminous fog. The wafting smells of simply mind-boggling cuisine will catch the nose and engulf the senses as one draws near to one of these diverse settlements. The bountiful life of the swamp provides endless culinary discoveries. The spices and wildlife makes for simply the best location to enjoy a selfish etouffee with celestial wild rice in the entire multiverse. But I could go on for hours about cooking. Don't get me started. These sleepy, happy communities will provide ample warning to mortal travellers to avoid the deeper reaches beyond the main tributaries of the river, as Beleriand is the prison of some epic, deadly creatures. Some tales say the prisoners of Beleriand are super powerful monsters along the lines of the Tarasque, or some monsters of mortal myth and legend. Others say that one such uh, is actually a former Archduke of the Lower Plains, perhaps a deposed elemental prince or even an imprisoned and deeply wounded deity or two, held for some crime only of concern to the other celestial gods. The indisputable fact is that evil creatures are sometimes caught lurking here. 
The native Gardinals of Beleriand are constantly fighting back attacks against the Lair. Getting caught up in one such battle is the most common adventuring encounter for player characters here. If players take the time to stop and be friendly with the locals, they can learn the nearby path to avoid such dangers. So safe passage across this vast swamp is basically a series of short trips from one isolated and lovely town to another, sampling their unique culture, learning their history and hearing the local folklore around amazing meals and glorious twilight evenings sung to sleep by the chorus of the swamps, before moving on with fond farewells and gifts to take on their way. Not an entirely unpleasant way to travel, but not a fast one. I guess it's something of a cosmic lesson about learning to take your time and get to know the land and the people one is passing through. There's an old saying, if you hurry all the time, you end up going nowhere, just faster. The main reason why Beleriand is a lesser known layer of Elysium is because the Gardinals keep it that way. They long ago transported their ancestor of all Hydras here, an immortal monster they could not defeat, so they had to imprison it deep within the plain, sealing off all portals and blocking Beleriand from all divination magic. This effectively turned the layer into an infinite cage, from which the only exit was the river Oceanus itself, whose blessed waters the Hydra can't touch. Notable locations within the layer are the ancient Aesimon fortress known as Nilis Thur, in the region known as Quesa's birthplace, now a centre of training and popular gathering place for the wandering Gardinals. They also have an outpost they built themselves long ago called Rubicon, located on an island in the middle of the river Oceanus near the point where it flows into the layer of Aeronia. There are some deities who call the Beleriand home, such as the Malaharandi goddess Nut, wife and sister of the god Geb, who was forcibly separated from him when he was ordered to travel to the world of Toril and protect the Mulan people in the time of the ancient Emaskeri Empire. Nut keeps to herself, much like the other divine beings who live here. Oh, I should mention, you can't reach this layer via Yggdrasil. The world tree doesn't connect here at all. Approaching the border of Aronia, the landscape of Beleriand becomes broken by great spires of rock that start to rise from the swamplands until the glowing mists become thicker and the low roar of the rapids and waterfalls of another planar transition come into view ahead. Again, dotted with many diverse vessels that ply these waters, loaded with spices, exotic medicines, and unique wildlife gathered from the endless swamps, bound for other plains marketplaces. The happy petitioners enjoying an adventurous eternity of rich and interesting trade and exploration. Aronia is a rising land of steep hills, sharp-toothed mountains, and white granite valleys, which divert the river again and again in an exciting realm, home to the divine realms of the gods of Chontia, Eldath, Hyatia, Lathander, Mistra, and Arogalan, as well as many others. Rugged foothills form the banks of the river Oceanus, picking up speed at places as it thunders over daring rapids and plunging into many of the rock formations and underground cave networks carved out of the brilliant stone. As the light bounces off the water surface, it reflects all the colours of the rainbow from the rock walls, illuminating incredible carvings made by petitioners, including many dwarven champions who recount tales of their heroic deeds from the ancient days of many primaterial worlds. The whistling and howling winds twist around the high peaks among the silver clouds and down at the base of the mountains, past high bluffs, plateaus and mazes, nestled against the calmer banks of the river and many well-established communities. Many of these settlements found beyond the river are built to the edges of the high plateaus, where the fearless petitioners take to the air with handmade vehicles, gliding alongside the winged angels and avian arboreal gardinals. Almost all travel is via the river, as the wind currents tend to be a bit too much for airships to handle, and most paths leading up the winding valleys and cliff faces only go so far as one or two destinations. Like most of Elysium, while the expanse of the layer is infinite, the land becomes more and more desolate the further one journeys from the banks of the river. So heading out that far, travellers will either be in search of something deliberately hidden away in the barren lands, or taking something to be hidden out there. Of course, the locals are always keeping a calmly watchful eye on those going back and forth into the wilderness. The weather is fierce on Aronia. It's not uncommon for great windstorms crackling with great bolts of lightning to put on a brilliant display of nature's power, and snowfalls dump a heavy burden on high peaks causing dangerous avalanches and feeding quite a few glaciers which melt back into the river's strong currents. There are seasons though, they tend to be a bit more extreme in their range of heat and cold than on the primaterial plane. The cold doesn't bother the native petitioners and celestials at all, they tend to be well prepared for the heat waves, 
what with their ready access to water and many water wheels and clever engineering of aqueducts providing flowing air cooled by evaporating mists through their sturdy homes and great market halls. Aronia is for the good souls who still want to be challenged in their afterlife, and the landscape provides endless amounts of rugged trails, hardy celestial beasts, and of course, the many, many caves can each have the potential to form a random crossing to another plane of existence, though most of them will cross over to the bordering planes, such as the high forests of Arvandor in the realm of Olympus, the infinite dual realms of Bitopia called Shurok and Dothian, and the plains of the happy hunting grounds, including the layers named Pragala, Karasuthra, and Brux. The lines that cross between these realms are really a lot more blurred than the Great Wheel cosmology map may give the impression of, and sometimes it's not until one finds a jovial little halfling village nestled against a massive spire of rock that connects to a twin realm far above the clouds that one will realise they just crossed from Elysium into Bitopia. You're not going to encounter border control stations, though again, beings of evil or even selfish proclivities may likely find themselves getting approached by a powerful gardener who just happens to be in the area. There are many winged creatures at home in the peaks and the valleys, including giant eagles and rocks, though I should mention, even they find the fierce winds very challenging, and you're not going to encounter any petitioners or celestials who are riding winged creatures as mounts on this plane. The vast bulk of travel is via the river, and even that is quite dangerous for those not very well experienced in it. The navigators of the Oceanus call themselves river rats, up in the cliffs, the plateaus and peaks, great golden fleeced mountain goats cavort on treacherous trails with prancing satyrs far from their home in the glades of Olympus. Every now and then, one may also happen across a questing hero from the realm of Isgard, and indeed, quite often, the silver clouds of any of the layers of Elysium will part around the epic branches of the world tree Yggdrasil, who touches on these plains and many others. Most of the time, if adventurers encounter monsters and other evil beings in Aronia, or on the other layers of Elysium, they are there because they are running in desperation from some band of celestial heroes, hunting them down for sport. Though any evil creature has to be completely frantic if they actually decide to intrude into the realm which is the source of all goodness in the multiverse. Some notable locations within Eronia are the settlements named Precipice, accurately named. It's a large community of giant eagles in Arakokra, built high up a steep sandstone cliff overlooking a deep lagoon formed by the river down below. If you happen to run across a stunning female Arakokra with an amazing opal necklace, silver skin and pink gold feathers, usually accompanied by a few jinn or air elementals, this is the moderately powerful goddess named Serenita, a member of the loose alliance of goodly gods of the aquatic mortal races. No avian being can willingly harm her and she tends to hang out with the lesser god of the giant eagles named Remnus. He manifests as a mighty giant eagle that has no such problems flying with divine precision and speed in the gale force winds of this plane, sometimes carrying other gods aloft as passengers. These two also get visits from other sky gods, such as Eardrifania of the Elven Pantheon, also sacred to the bird folk. I'm not sure how, but these gods can easily pass between the realm and the sky above Krigala, the first layer of the Beastlands, which is a dense forest, endless forest stretching for thousands of miles before they're lost from sight among the mists and weather patterns the forests themselves generate across the plain. Some river rats will pass through the supremely peaceful lake realm of the goddess Eldath. As a goddess of peace, there is absolutely no danger to any vessel here, but it's pretty much a certainty that every sentient being on board is going to doze off into a deeply restful sleep as the river craft drifts across the lake following the currents and the gentle breezes, waking up only when they eventually reach the other side. Some recount dreaming of a beautiful, ten-foot-tall woman. Humanoid, but whether elf, human, dryad, or something else, they can never say for sure. That is Eldath, every now and then stepping aboard a vessel to smile down on the travellers, healing ills and filling their minds with reassurance and love, occasionally checking out their cargo, sometimes leaving a gift or two behind. You never know. Other nature gods have similar realms along the rivers, many winding and hidden paths through the mountains, amazing lost valleys of super verdant wildlife, of stunning beauty and diversity. Every scholar and explorer of nature's most wild and exotic places would happily wander this realm discovering such treasures for all eternity. And many do. It's not uncommon to be able to purchase elixirs of all kinds of restorative and enriching effects thanks to these petitioners stopping by to experiment with super rare samples gathered on their adventures. Eventually, as one travels downstream, the currents once more flow into a bordering region where the mountains become more like the regular sized ranges of the prime material plane. 
The settlements dot the banks of the great river Oceanus with towers that airships can dock at before going too far into the fierce winds beyond. All manner of river vessels come and go, and not a whole lot of folks there know that somewhere nearby the land plunges down into a huge cave complex that is the entrance to the divine realm of the halfling god of earth and of death. Not as fearsome as that title sounds, his realm called Soul Earth throngs with the souls of halfling petitioners who gather here before they are sent to their assigned places along the outer plains, with a great many travelling directly from Soul Earth and into the bordering plain of Bitopia. Sort of like a way station that receives all the soul traffic coming in from the fugue plane that borders the deep ethereal and the astral planes. Anyway, more epic waterfalls and cascades of dazzling rainbows with floating islands of rock and an impressive structure called the Twilight Gate, a massive stone structure that soars like an open cathedral of carved rock, constantly worked on by blissfully happy dwarven petitioners who carve incredible details into countless decorative and huge works of art inlaid with every kind of gem and precious metal that shimmer and glitter with the light gleaming from the waters that passes below and beyond them. And then we are into the first layer of Elysium named Amoria. I should mention that while I talk about the light bouncing off the river Oceanus, this doesn't come from sun or moons or stars in the sky. The light of Elysium just is... The sky is dotted with the moving and shining forms of celestials, archons, angels and various divine beings and other celestial creatures and their vehicles soaring through a sky of brilliant cerulean with uh, it only darkening as far as a deep indigo at any given time. Day and nights do occur, time passes normally on these planes but it's uh, quite random really. The gods have more influence over the seasons, days and nights in any sort of cyclic natural process. Amoria is easily one of the most hospitable places in the Outer Plains, aside from its tendency to trap beings in their addiction to its peace and fulfilment. Small towns dot the banks of the river Oceanus, and islands of rolling hills rise from the river itself. The bulk of the population of Elysium lives on this layer. Even so, Amoria is a deeply peaceful place where those who live there take any opportunities to help others and demonstrate goodness. There is still misfortune, but it's almost like such things exist only so the denizens of the plane can express their goodness and provide help to those in need whenever they can. Calamities here, such as a village fire or capsized boat, test and identify those who are from other planes. Travellers to Amoria are besieged by small errands and tasks, but if they complete them, they will always find powerful allies at their side. Amoria has a very comfortable climate, so the Gardinals often deal sternly with storm giant druids and other creatures who can control weather by causing sudden disruptions that can have unfortunate long-term side effects. The rulers of the Gardinals also live on Amoria. These supremely powerful Gardinals are as powerful as the Archdukes of the Nine Hells or the Demon Lords of Ruin within the Abyss. First among their number is Prince Thalicid, the wisest and most powerful of Leonals, also one of the largest. Thalicid's lieutenants are known as the Five Companions, the Lupine Duke Lucan, the Bear-like Duchess Callisto, the Winged Duke Windhair, the Equine Lord Hewan, and the Antlered Lord Rannoch. Together, they organise the efforts of the Gardinals, sending them on missions against evil, even striking into the lower plains to recover those captured from the forces of evil. Brilliant green meadows dotted with starburst flowers, pools as deep blue as Jay's plumage, and silver clouds drifting against a perfect sky. The place itself seems to vibrate with its own sense of life and intensity that only grows more and more rich, immersive and amazing, moment to moment. Every vista is better than the last, every encounter a deeper and friendlier connection to just the best beings you will ever meet. It is the most perfect day after the most perfect day, with restful evenings of long conversations, delicious meals, old aches and pains just fading away along with those deeper hurts that people of the prime material plane just seem to take as an inevitable part of life. The loss of innocence, the regret of broken friendships, mistakes that ruin relationships, people who grow apart and never manage to reconnect, dreams dashed for no better reason than someone happened to take your spot before you got where you wanted to be. These things, hurts and scars that linger and build on a mortal soul, are also slowly but surely salved and healed by the very essence of Elysium. And it is the most potent of traps, one of pure bliss. I assure you, my friend, no pain of loss compares to having to depart from Elysium before it is too late. And you never really know who will succumb to its charms first or last. But you will know instantly when it's too late for them. 
When asked about where they're going next or what mission drew them here, and they stop, remember once more, and then they, that pause, that look in their eye, when they realize that there's nothing going on outside of Elysium, that they want more than to stay right where they are. And you know that those who they left behind, anyone expecting to see them again, it would literally take a miracle for them to ever return to life that they once knew. And just like that, their mortal form is gone. And you see that now you are talking to another petitioner of Elysium, blissfully happy and at peace at long last. Of course, not everyone is at risk of this. Those who are not so good-natured really do feel like there's some deep conflict within themselves that just doesn't rest easy on this plane. Sadly, perhaps fortunately, they will never be at peace here, and their mortal existence is preserved for them to walk or float back out of Emoria and beyond to other realms of existence. There are many, many unique places in Amoria, most of them located close to the banks of the river Oceanus. Some notable good locations are the realms of quite a few gods aligned with the causes and spread of goodness across the multiverse. Indeed, there are many bastions of the mighty cardinals who use Amoria as their base from which to direct their agents across the multiverse to combat the forces of evil, often sending active, urgent rescue missions to the lower planes, even to the diametrically opposed layers of Hades, in order to recover captives of evil beings. Brought back to the healing centers of Elysium, tended to by celestials and divine powers to restore them to health and sanity, often a difficult task, such as the depravity and violence routinely dished out in the realms of evil. Even the cardinals themselves often need to recover from, after such missions from the horrors they have to face in order to accomplish their most vital objectives. The goddesses Hathor, Ishtar and Isis have realms here, plus you can find members of the Elven Seldrine who travel here quite often, particularly Kerith Sotheril and Tethryn Veralde, who are masters of spells and blades. Kerith, a lesser Elven deity, manifests as a stunning Elven woman with golden hair and eyes that constantly change colour, draped in a spectacular robe of literal rainbows. She shares the realm of Tethridar with her consort Tethryn, the Shining One, the master of blades and patron of all Elven blade singers. Tethryn is hard to miss. He's boisterous and strident, adventurous and quite impulsive for an elven deity, quite as likely to start a fight as to finish one, victorious, and while he is a thoroughly good entity, he is also mercurial and emotional, thus can be quite unpredictable and, when roused to sudden violence, a terrible foe. Of course, the elven gods travel widely and they are just as likely to be in Arborea as they are in any of the neighbouring plains at any given time. There is also realms within Amoria that are not claimed by any deity, such as the lush territory of nature and peace, densely populated by petitioners, celestials and half-celestial creatures, the cardinals, a great number of visiting beings from other planes, and so on. Trade and commerce take place along wide, slow-moving sections of the river, with flotillas of merchant vessels lashed together to form the floating markets of Amoria. There are many settlements on the banks, each unique and most quite ancient, most locals have a great love of nature and are skilled gardeners and landscape artists who have all the time they need to perfect the gardens and produce the very best crops, the most spectacular flowers and varieties of foods and beverages that are sought after at great expense by people across the entire multiverse. So, I raise my beverage to you, my friend. Thank you for joining me on this journey across Elysium. Let your troubles wash away in the river's flow, and may you be at peace. If you enjoyed this video, I'd greatly appreciate your company in the comment section below. Let me know what this video has inspired within your imagination and where you would like to go next in the Outer Plains. Hit that like button, share the experience with your friends on whatever platform you prefer, check out my other videos, I've plenty to choose from, or perhaps take up the challenge of binge watching my huge playlist of Monster Ecology videos. If you are particularly happy with what I do, I have a presence on Subscribestar and Patreon for those who wish to provide me with support and join my most like-minded friends and exclusive boards on the Discord server, who do get access to all my written scripts. I post along there with my videos, so you can read along as you watch or listen. And also, this video is closed captioned, so you can read along as you listen. Thank you all so much for your kind support and kind words. It gives me great pleasure that I hear that my work has encouraged you to get back into or try out Dungeons & Dragons. Stay well, be kind to each other, we all geek with pride. And I'll be back with more for you, as always, very soon.